Welcome to Down to Earth but Heavenly Minded Podcast. Hosted by Irving Rich, The Way of Life. Being. Notes of Lectures Delivered in Scandinavia, 1904. By J. Boyd. Revised. London, G. Morrish, 20, Paternoster Square. 1906. How to Contend for the Faith Jude. I desire to follow a little on the lines we have had before us on former occasions. That our hearts may be further occupied with the divine affections in which we live according to God. The writer of this epistle would seek to have these affections promoted in the saints to whom he writes. His desire was to write to them about the common salvation, but he was turned aside to something else to which he thought it needful to direct their attention. He speaks of the salvation as the common salvation, that is, it was not a salvation such as was accorded to Noah and his house, which was only available for eight persons. Nor was it restricted like the mercy of God to Lot, which set no more than three souls beyond the reach of death. Nor was it like the deliverance effected for Israel when they groaned beneath the oppression of Pharaoh in the land of Egypt, but it is a salvation that is proclaimed to the whole human race. And is the common inheritance of the people of God. The grace of God that brings salvation to all men has appeared, and God presents himself in the character of a saviour God, who will have all men to be saved, and to come to the knowledge of the truth. And the proof of this is that the Mediator gave himself a ransom for all, and thus opened up a way of salvation for all. It was of this salvation that Jude desired to write, but another thing of pressing importance came before him, and for the moment lifted his thoughts from the blessed subject. Danger to the faith of the beloved people of God lurked in their path, and to this he feels it necessary to draw their attention. Evil men had crept into the profession of Christianity, ungodly men, turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness, and denying the only Lord God, and our Lord Jesus Christ. They cast off the authority of the Lord. And having done this they refused to submit themselves to any earthly authority, they despise dominion, and speak evil of dignities. But that the destruction of these evil men was certain the saints very well knew. For they had had many examples of the judgment of God against the evil doer brought before them. The first example we get is that of the people saved out of the land of Egypt, and afterwards destroyed on account of their unbelief, the second is the angels who kept not their first estate but left their own habitation, reserved in everlasting chains under darkness to the judgment of the great day, and the third is the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah giving themselves over to fornication, and going after strange flesh, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. The great mass of the professors of Christianity have not faith, and where there is not faith the heavenly position which belongs to the church must be abandoned. And when this is given up the whole profession soon becomes characterized by pollution. Unbelief, apostasy and fleshly pollution characterize the Christian profession today. Their swift downward course is set before us in the way of Cain, the error of Balaam, and the gainsaying of Kor. Like Cain. In the pride of their heart they refuse to bow to the righteous judgment of God that rests upon them on account of sin, and Christ, who maintained the rights of God upon earth, and who offered the sacrifice that was acceptable to God, is hated and persecuted. Out of this flows the error of Balaam, the leaders in Christendom who call themselves prophets of God lend their services to the prince of the world. That the true people of God may be kept out of the inheritance given to them of God. The sin of Korah was rebellion against the authority vested in Moses and the priesthood established in Aaron. Korah was a Levite, but was not satisfied with the blessed place of service given to him of God, but aspired to the priesthood, and this sin is fully developed in Christendom. Men who have taken the place of servants, and who may be used of God to minister his word to his people, are not content with this service, but set themselves up as priests between the saints and God. Every saint of God is a priest, one as much as another, and the great high priest is Christ on high in the presence of God, and between the people and God there is none other than he. But there are those in the profession who set themselves apart from the others as a specially sanctified class who claim the right that only belongs to the Son of God, and for this there is no forgiveness perished in the gainsaying of Kor. For individuals who have taken up that position there is surely in the mercy of God salvation, but for the system from which it springs there is no forgiveness. In view of all this the Spirit of God would stir up the saints to contend for the faith. The effort of the enemy is to rob us of the precious faith. Whatever we may lose in the battle is not really loss if we keep the faith. Paul lost everything in defense of the faith. He lost his property, reputation, religion, liberty and life, but he kept the faith. He could say when the battle was over and he was going out of the world, I have fought a good fight, I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. It is a great thing to be able to say, when the battle is ended, I have kept the faith. But if we are to keep the faith we must contend for it. If you keep the faith you will not have an easy time in the world, you will know something of what tribulation means. 
The world is hostile to the faith, and though it may put on the cloak of Christianity it will not have the faith of Christ in its heart. Therefore if you and I are to keep the faith we must be ready to shed our blood in its defense. We desire to follow peace with all men, but whether it be peace or whether it be war, the faith must be held dear to our hearts. But we are not likely to contend to retain that which we do not value, and therefore the faith must have some importance in our eyes. And if it has importance to us we shall seek to be well established in it. We may today have grasped only a very little of the precious metal, but if we value what we have got we shall be found eagerly reaching out after more. And therefore we are exhorted to build ourselves up on it. If the servant of God in this epistle desired to write to them about the common salvation, and found it necessary to turn to another subject, he nevertheless does bring out very definitely that in which salvation consists. The love of God. The whole power of salvation lies in the knowledge of God. Christ is said to be a light to the Gentiles, that he might be for salvation to the ends of the earth. The light of God is in him, and, God is love. In Titus chapter 3 we get the way in which God has intervened for us as a saviour, he has declared his kindness and love. This is the light in which God has approached us. In the beginning of Genesis the earth upon which God was going to work is said to have been without form and void and swathed in darkness. And the first thing we get is that light is commanded to shine out of the darkness, and if God is going to work for the salvation of man, the first thing is that he brings in light. This has come to us in the person of Christ, and is the light of his kindness and love. In the same chapter we get the way that light has been made good to us. According to his mercy he saved us by the washing of regeneration, and renewing of the Holy Spirit. The washing of regeneration takes in new birth, and may refer to baptism. And by these means we are brought into the kingdom of God, and the Holy Spirit sheds the love of God abroad in our hearts. And we are thus renewed in our affections and live in the love of God that has come to light in Christ, and instead of being distinguished by envy and malice and hatred we are marked by righteousness and love. And for us this is salvation. Jude insists upon our keeping ourselves in this love of God. There are two means by which we are to do this. The first, is building ourselves up on our most holy faith, and the second, praying in the Holy Ghost. Instead of being careless as to the faith, and letting it go rather than get into trouble with men on account of it, we seek that we may get better established in it. And as to praying in the Holy Ghost, it is not merely saying prayers, even though we may mean what we ask for, but it is drawing near to God and expressing in his ear the thoughts of the heart which have been begotten there by the Spirit of God. It is to know that we have spoken to him, and that he has heard us, and that what we have asked has been granted to us. By these two means we are to keep ourselves in the love of God. What a blessed place in which to keep ourselves. That love has come to light in Christ, it shines out in all its power in his death for us, and we are to walk in the sunshine of it. On a cold, cheerless winter day the sun in the heavens may suddenly break forth upon the world in all its heavenly radiance, warmth and comfort and we may creep along cold and shivering on the shady side of the street, and lose all the comfort that it is destined by God to bring to us. And so we may walk down here in the shadows of the world without availing ourselves of the great love of God that shines for all in Christ in heaven. The Lord direct your hearts into the love of God, was the desire of the Apostle for the young Thessalonian believers, and the oldest believer upon earth cannot get into a better place. And Paul could say, The life which I live in the flesh I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me, and gave himself for me. Then we get. Looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ to eternal life. Eternal life is looked at here in a dispensational way, not in the moral way in which it is viewed in John's writings. With John we have it now in the knowledge of the Father and Jesus Christ his sent one, but when Christ comes we shall have it in its own proper sphere. Next we get work to do in the scene around us. If our hearts are in the love of God we shall be able to serve him in connection with his interests, and there will be plenty of work for us to do. But we must first of all be right ourselves or we shall not be able to get others right. If we are to save others we must first save ourselves. 1 Timothy chapter 4 verse 16. Of some have compassion, God has had compassion upon us, and we are to go out in his compassions to others. All are not alike guilty of the corruption that has come into the profession of the name of Christ, there are the leaders and the led, and we must make a difference. It is not likely that the leaders will hear you, but many that have been led astray by their means may be rescued. But while we seek to recover others, it is like pulling people out of the fire, and if we are not careful we may get badly burned ourselves in the work of rescue. We are to go to people in the love of God, and while we abhor all the filthy surroundings of those we desire to save, we do our best to get them extricated. We are to hate the garment in which they may have clothed themselves, because it is spotted by the flesh, but their souls we love in the love of God. 
unto him that is able to keep you from stumbling. Blessed be God, he is able to do this. Even in this dangerous world where so many apparently strong men have fallen to rise no more he is able to keep us from stumbling. And he is able also to present us faultless before the presence of his glory with exaltation. May we keep ourselves in the love of God. May we ever walk in the light and warmth and comfort of it, and thus find salvation, for then the things that dominate others will have no power over us. For the things of this world will have no attraction for us. Well may we say, to the only wise God our Saviour, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and ever. Amen.